Welcome to the Ernie Chambers Show. Brothers and sisters, friends, enemies, and neutrals, I'm here again. There is something in particular that I'd like to get to today. I may and I may not, because Cyrus the virus is still out there doing his dirty work, and I've got to let him know that I'm paying attention. Even though I got my shots, I got my booster shot, if I left here today, turned on the news, and there was Dr. Fauci or somebody from the CDC or the World Health Organization, and they said an additional booster shot will give you increased immunity or antibodies against Delta, Omicron variant, and all the relatives that may come, I would get that shot before the sun set, if I could, before the sun rose, if I could, but at latest the next day. So this is going to be an intro to an article I'm going to read, and there are several that I intend to look at. Why should I not share things that I see which I think are of value. I don't know how many people watch this, but if both of them continue to watch, well, I'm satisfied. This appeared in the Omaha World Herald, and it was last September, and that's not long ago. It's written by a guy, I don't know how to pronounce his first name, W-E-Y-S-A-N. So I'll just say Wayson Dunn, D-U-N. He is a retired veteran of the FBI and served as the special agent in charge of multiple FBI field offices around the U.S., including the Omaha field office, which covers Nebraska and Iowa. He probably wasn't there at the time, but on one of those bogus arrests, one of the officers told me that they arrested me pursuant to the request of the FBI because the FBI wanted and needed a mug shot of me, but there was nothing in the nature of a federal violation, even by anybody's wildest imagination, and they couldn't get away with taking me into custody of the kind that would require a mug shot. So all of these devils work together. I mention that because some of you are going to be shocked at what he had to say in view of the divide in the country. Blue over here, red over there. I'm neither blue nor red. I am what I am, and that's all that I am. This is what he wrote, and the World Herald printed it. Those who read my columns know I'm on the conservative side of the political spectrum, and I strive to be fact-based and balanced. I am a patriotic, proud American, an advocate of law and order, and I embrace the qualities that make our country one of the greatest in the world. At this point, they'd be blowing trumpets, beating drums, and waving the flag. It is from my perspective as a patriotic conservative that I write about the, quote, American way, unquote, to respond to the COVID pandemic. I had mentioned pandemic, epidemic, and endemic. Pandemic means everywhere, all over the globe. An epidemic is where it's in a given geographic area, a large one, but it's not everywhere, as with a pandemic. Endemic means that it has reached the stage where there are vaccines, other treatments that can control it, maybe even prevent you from uh, getting it, like the flu, and that means it's endemic. Endemic means it pertains to a relatively speaking, small, limited area, like maybe a country or part of a country, but it's like the cold, the flu, and these other things that happen. So right now, Cyrus the virus is a pandemic all over the world. Continuing. 
Let's step away from the current political and societal polarization and remember what made this country great. In my opinion, the country has never been great. They had the most brutal, inhumane type of slavery known to humanity. It was inhumane, it was cruel, it was vicious. Our young women, our girls were ravished, our young men, the same. And in addition to that, they were brutally beaten, murdered, and other things done to them that I won't even mention. So America is not great, never has been great. And until they come face to face with their past, acknowledge it and make what atonement is possible, it will never be a great country. And that's why they're so sensitive and don't want anything said in the schools about their vicious marauding past. But continuing, the preamble of the US Constitution articulates the idea that, quote, we the people, unquote, must collectively, quote, ensure domestic tranquility, unquote, and, quote, promote the general welfare, unquote, of this country. President John Adams wrote in 1778, quote, it was the duty of a good citizen to sacrifice all to his country, unquote. Also, consider the closing line of the Declaration of Independence, which states, quote, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor, unquote. They didn't have honor, and it certainly couldn't be called sacred. The one who signed larger than anybody else, John Hancock, was not only a slaveholder, but a slave trader. The British wanted to catch him because of his slave smuggling. And that's what Paul Revere's ride was about, to warn Hancock that they were after him and he needed to flee, which Americans were good at doing. But because Paul Revere was primarily uh, an artisan, there was another man named William Dawes who did most of the writing, R-I-D-I-N-G, to spread the warning. It was not to tell the pat patriots, as they called them, to arm themselves. They were told to hide any munitions, any weaponry they had, or it would be confiscated by the British who were looking for John Hancock, the slave smuggler, and it could be bad for them. But anyway, this man being white thinks that these men had sacred honor because that's what they described, whatever it was they had when they signed the Declaration of Independence, primarily copied by Thomas Jefferson, who was a slaveholder and had children on these slave women. He was a rapist, a trafficker, and an adulterer. But this man and others consider them great. And the only way they can do that is to try to clean them up by hiding what they did, saying that it will not be taught to the youngsters in school, don't want the oldsters to talk about it. Most of them don't know anything about it because they didn't learn in school. I hate to digress, but I must. Continuing with Dunn's column. The foundation upon which, and when the word country is used and the word our is in front of it, it's hard for me to say it. It's not our country that includes me in the sense of being patriotic and all this other nonsense, but it's more our country is black people than theirs. We were here before them. In 1619, the first people came over here being kidnapped from Africa, but there was at least one African with Columbus. And he came here before any of those other people. And Columbus never set foot in America. Vespucci is the one who first set foot on this soil. There are so many things that are erroneous 
in the schools, a lot of it is outright fabrication. Like this white woman named Molly Pitcher, who is supposed to have been a heroine during the Revolutionary War, and she carried water. Well, you wouldn't carry water in a pitcher. There was a bucket like that you carried the water in, and that's what she used. But because they were trying to glamorize while keeping her feminine, Molly, this Molly, used a pitcher. Carrying on the battlefield, a pitcher. That's what the pitcher came from. Her last name was not Pitcher. There are so many myths about this country. But if we're going to talk about longevity, we were here before most of them and their ancestors. In addition to that, as soon as a white person get off the boat today, he or she is entitled to everything that is offered in this country to white people. And one of the first things they learn, and they probably learned this before they got here, is the degradation that white people want to keep black people in in this country. So however unsuccessful these newly landed white people from Europe were, there would always be a stratum of people beneath them whom they could consider themselves better than, and that is us. That's why white people of today want us to function as carpets on which they walk. They're afraid, afraid to meet us on an equal footing. So they have created a mythology, an attitude toward black people, which is designed to cast us low and them high. Things that are taught in school when I was there were designed to embarrass us. The story, and I'm not going to get away from Cyrus the virus, but racism is a more deadly virus for black people. There is no antidote for it. There is no vaccine that will cure it. No vaccine that will provide antibodies so that white Americans will not be racist. When they're little children, they're taught. They take these things in with their mother's milk. They hear the slurs, the other things that white adults will say against and about black people. And with the computers, I call it the gadget, but all of this yow yow and misinformation on Facebook, Twitter, and all the rest of them, you will find the racist, white supremacist nonsense. And the thing about it, they have dumb white people who really are detrimental to the cause of white supremacy because the only thing they're supreme to might be a snail or an earthworm and other slimy creatures that live under the ground. Oh, don't think my words are harsh because they're only words. I don't take anybody's freedom. I don't ravish anybody's mama, sister, or daughter. I don't tell little white children that they are less than human beings. One of these days, I'm going to bring copies of photographs of me and little white children. One day, I, I used, I, when I was down there, I had a suite of offices, four. And I heard something in one of the outer offices, a little boy, Ernie, Ernie, Ernie. And I looked up, and here comes this little boy, because Cindy had pointed him back where I was. He ran in. He jumped up on my lap. And he had some popcorn that he's going to share with me. His little fingers were sticky. So I thanked him and told him, no, thank you. Well, as it turned out, he wanted his mother to bring him to see me. Cindy said when she opened the door, he started calling out my name and ran right past her looking for me. And when she pointed, that's when he came back there. While well, I have the picture of him on my lap, my knee, and he's eating his popcorn. Another little boy that was autistic wanted to see me. 
and his mother brought him. I had some small dumbbells in my office. They weighed 20 or 30 pounds. And he was trying to pick one up and he couldn't pick it up or move it. So I knew he wouldn't hurt himself. And I'm reluctant to tell a child, don't do whatever it is the child wants to do. But if the child would be hurt naturally, I will intervene. I have what I call an album that shows me and I'm surrounded in some of the pictures by little white children. One day I was coming down the stairs from the chamber to go to my office. And as I approached the bottom of the stairs, there were all these little squealing children running toward me and calling out my name, Ernie, Ernie. A reporter from the Lincoln Journal Star wrote the article and I will read it when I bring it. And she said, nobody could say what it was that triggered this adoration. But they were all in their little Catholic uniforms. Here were little Catholic children. And there are Catholics who say I'm anti-Catholic. And yet here their little children are that I had never seen. And I don't know why they were drawn to me in this way. But there is something maybe that could be called virtue that leaves me and embraces little children. People say that children can sense things. I could tell you a secret, but I'm not going to. Sometimes a person would be in that Capitol building and one time even in a restaurant and a baby was crying and I went over and I took the baby and I held the baby and there was a communication between me and that baby. And pretty soon the baby stopped crying, looked up at me and started cooing. But I'm not gonna tell you what the secret was. Maybe you got it too. In which case, I don't need to tell you. Those who don't have it, don't need it. Let me put it like this. They do need it so they will not be brutal, cruel and mean to little children. They're innocent. They haven't done anything wrong. They're at the developmental stage in their life. For somebody to what they call spank a child goes all through me. And I want to intervene, but it's somebody else's child and they do what they feel is best. But I leave any situation where somebody is what they call punishing a child. The child never has done anything that the punisher is doing to that child. And if I did to the adult, what the adult did to that child, I would be charged with assault and battery. But that was a digression. I wanna tell you why I don't refer to this as our or my country. It's mine in the sense of having every right and having been here, my ancestors and forebears longer than those of white people, but in the sense of being a flag waver, a lover of what America is, that's nonsense. I refer to the flag as a rag. Every place that I see a flag, there is racism. The Ku Klux Klan did what they did under the aegis of the American flag, bombed churches, raped black women, burned houses under the aegis of the flag. The flag and that Confederate rag are the same as far as I'm concerned, just different designs. But going on with what this man wrote about Cyrus the virus, talking about Americans. We are bound together as Americans by the idea that while we have the right to pursue our own happiness, we also have significant responsibilities to others. Generations of Americans before us demonstrated service and sacrifice during wars, pandemics, the Great Depression, and the global war on terrorism after the 911 attacks. And Black people fought in every war this country ever had, from the Revolution, the Civil War, 
the War of 1812, Spanish-American War, First World War, Second War, World War, Korea, Vietnam, every place this country has ever fought, Black people have been there. And every place until Truman desegregated the army, there was rigid segregation. And even after he formalistically desegregated it, the discrimination was and remains a part of the military, but continuing. Let us also remember President John F. Kennedy's famous challenge, quote, ask not what your country can do for you, ask what you can do for your country, unquote. Our country became great because generations of Americans knew that liberty and duty go hand in hand. Oh, they wanted us to assume all the duties as black people, but no liberty. I grew up, this is him, I'm reading from him. I grew up learning that the American way of doing things meant accepting personal responsibility, being a good neighbor, making the right choices and using common sense. It also includes doing things for the greater good of the country and society, even if personally inconvenient because that is the price of our hard fought freedom. The discord and conflict over the COVID pandemic causes me to think we have lost sight of these tenants of good citizenship. It shouldn't be tenants, T-E-N-A-N-T-S. A tenant is one who releases property from another. Tenet, T-E-N-E-T, is a concept, an idea, a proposition. So he had not heard or seen in writing the word tenant, but that's what he had in mind when he said these tenants. And that's where a lot of white people are. I used to chide them on the floor of the legislature that I could spell better than they, read better than they, and use grammar better than they, because I focused on it and learned it. A lot of it, they went by sound, and as a result, they mispronounced words. There is a term, a word, I pronounce it disparate. That means different and contrary to. White people who know what the word is, they'll pronounce it disparate. You know why I never pronounced it disparate? Because when I would pronounce it that way, and a white person who was ignorant and a reporter would write it, they would not put spelled disparate properly, D-E-S-P-A-R. A-T, they would write desperate, as though you're really uptight, you're nervous and jumpy. You know what desperation is. So now I don't say disparate, I say disparate to help them if they're going to quote me, spell it correctly. I, you see, am no more intelligent, no more grammatically correct when I speak than the one who is recording what I speak. If that person does not no grammar, does not know how to spell, and puts what I say or purportedly said in quotation marks, people who can spell, who do know what words are, will think I'm ignorant. But it's the ignorance of the reporter and obviously the ignorance of the editor, unless the editor is lazy and doesn't read or is as ignorant, I say again, as the reporter. And I'm sensitive about those things. When you mess with my mind, then you're getting on the fighting side of me, metaphorically speaking. Continuing. We Americans have always met challenges posed by external enemies. The greatest generation came together to defeat fascism in World War II. Americans accepted the rationing of food and gasoline to win that war. Parents sent their kids off knowing it could be the last time they saw them. Women worked tirelessly in factories to make the munitions our troops needed. My mother worked at the bomber plant. This was not during the First World War. Oh, he said the Second World War. But she worked at, it was called Martin Bomber Plant. And so did my father. But anyway, when they show the workers, Millie the Riveter, is a white woman. 
always white. Although when you get right down to it, a lot of the hard work was done by black people. And black people would make jokes that white people were not told. One of the favorite ones was to show how ignorant white people are. And no matter how old a black person was who would shine shoes in the airport or the train station when people rode trains or anywhere else, white people would refer to him as a shoe shine boy. So this one white man came in, got his shoes shine. He had a Hamburg hat, carried a rolled up umbrella over his arm. So he had some money and the white man after the shoes were shined, he said, that, that's a pretty good job, boy. What's the average tip? And the black man said, $20. And he said, $20, that's the average tip? The black man said, yes, you asked me, I told you. Well, now this white man wants to impress the shoeshine boy, so he reached in his pocket and gave him a $20 bill. And the, the black man laughed. He said, by the way, boss, that's what they like to be called. By the way, boss, you're the first one to come up to the average. There were young guys who went to Creighton with me and they were chair car porters or whatever they did on the train. I never worked on a train, never worked for the railroad. And one of them said that this white guy came up and said, George, what time is it? And this, the young guy, he said, I looked at him and I smiled and I said, how did you guess my name? Oh, he said, how did you know my name is George? Well, that's what they call all the porters. And the white man said, well, I just guessed it. He said, then guess what time it is. You had to have a comeback. Let me continue. We are again facing an external enemy in the form of the COVID virus. Those who think this is far left hyperbole may wish to recall that President Donald Trump himself often referred to the virus as an invisible enemy with which we are at war. Americans live through years of brutal sacrifice to prevail over external enemies in World War II, and now we're throwing fits about wearing a mask or getting a vaccine to defeat a deadly disease? I understand skepticism of government. Indeed, as a career government official, I agree a measure of skepticism is sometimes warranted, but those who think this pandemic and vaccines are some sort of government plot or nefarious hoax are not using the common sense for which Americans are known. Black people say, you don't have the sense you were born with. Continuing, one does not have to believe, quote, the government, unquote. Just look at the resurgence of infections, hospitalizations, and deaths. Listen to the stories of otherwise healthy people who put off vaccination and died or nearly died. Hear the pleas of exhausted healthcare professionals. Look at the fact that major medical facilities in Nebraska have again stopped elective surgeries and hospitals in some states are running out of intensive care beds again. Vaccines and vaccine mandates are nothing new. We eradicated smallpox and polio with mandatory vaccination programs. The US Supreme Court supported compulsory vaccination laws in 1905. The case was Jacobson versus Massachusetts stating, quote, real liberty for all could not exist under the operation of a principle which recognizes the right of each individual person to use his own liberty, whether in respect of his person or his property, regardless of the injury that may be done to others, unquote. The court further stated mandatory vaccination was, quote, necessary in order to protect the public health and secure the public safety, unquote. I do not advocate broad national or state mask mandates because one size fits all solutions rarely work well. However, mandates tailored to specific circumstances, such as crowded public spaces, 
where social distancing is difficult are appropriate. Local government, business, and educational entities should have the authority to man mandate masks in the interest of public health and safety based on the circumstances and risks in their respective jurisdictions. I am an advocate of personal choice, but that requires that we make informed and reasoned choices. Those who question the efficacy or safety of masks may wish to consider this. Would doctors, nurses, and paramedics wear masks daily if they didn't work or were harmful? What about the fact that we had virtually no flu last winter when everyone was masking? Wearing a mask to protect oneself and others is a minimal sacrifice. It's time for us to come together as Americans to win the war against COVID by sacrificing just a fraction of what previous generations have for the common good of our country. It's the American way. Here's an article from December. December 30th in the World Herald. Family, their comment in the headline, overcrowding at hospitals contributed to man's death. This is a reprint from the Des Moines Register, although it appeared in the Omaha World Herald. The family of a retired school superintendent who died from an infection unrelated to COVID-19 believes he would have had a better chance of surviving had his transfer to a larger hospital not been delayed for 15 days because of the pandemic. Dale Weeks's twin daughters told the Des Moines Register that their father stayed at the relatively small hospital in Newton East. Newton, east of Des Moines, because larger hospitals couldn't spare a bed for him. Weeks died November 28th at age 78. Weeks lived in the southern Iowa town of Seymour, where he was the school superintendent before he retired in 2007. He went to the hospital in nearby Centerville on November 1st, thinking he might be experiencing the side effects of a flu shot or COVID-19 booster shot, but doctors diagnosed sepsis, a dangerous bloodborne infection. His family said the Centerville Hospital did not have a bed for him, and it took that hospital until the next day to find one in Newton, 80 miles north. He received intravenous antibiotics, but his infection did not disappear. Family members repeatedly asked whether he could be transferred to a more advanced hospital. Quote, we kept being told he was on a list of degrees of severity and his number had not come up. His number wasn't up for that, but it was up for something else. His number had not come up, said Jennifer Overson, o Owenson of Des Moines, who is one of Weeks' twin daughters and one of his four children. He was aware of the situation, Owenson said, quote, he was like, why can't something be done, unquote, she asked. Representatives of the hospitals declined to comment on Weeks' case, but acknowledged the frustration caused by hospital crowding. Marcy Peterson, spokesperson for the Mercy One system that operates the Newton Hospital, said hospitals across the U.S. are dealing with the spread of the Delta and Omicron COVID-19 variants, but also other cases of trauma and illness. Weeks was transported November 17th to the University of Iowa Hospital System, where doctors concluded on November 25th that he needed surgery to deal with a severe infection in an artery near his stomach. His daughter said, the next day's surgery lasted 17 hours, but weeks continued to struggle, and a second shorter surgery did not halt his decline. Although weeks might have died, had he been admitted immediately to a larger medical center sooner, his other twin daughter, Julia Samansky of Ankeny said, quote, I think 
it would have given us a fairer chance. And you know who the ones are filling up these hospital beds? The ones who won't get in, get vaccinated. There was a story on the national news of this man who desperately needs a heart transplant, but he's not going to get one because he was not vaccinated. And before these transplants are given, remember, somebody died in order for that heart to exist. Hearts are scarce. You don't just go down to the hardware store and say, I want to buy a heart. So they will not provide a transplant if a person is not ill, if there's no likelihood the person will survive. Why transplant a perfectly good functioning heart into a dead person? So this man who did not get a vaccination will not get a transplant. And some hospitals have gone even a step further and will not perform major surgery if the person is unvaccinated or has COVID for obvious reasons. Medical people took a Hippocratic oath whose first principle is first do no harm. That doesn't just relate, obviously, to the patient, but first do no harm, period. Harm would be done if time were given to somebody who's not going to survive anyway. And it's different when a person has a virus like Cyrus the virus, and maybe was in a very serious auto accident, and there's no guarantee the person will survive. There are different stages, different circumstances, and each case is dealt with individually. But then there are certain general categories which make decisions a lot easier. Somebody who is unvaccinated for COVID and has some of the symptoms is not going to get a heart transplant, period. There was a situation where, I'll just go ahead and read these two articles. City, state, layout cases and mandate fight. I'll just read the one where the decision from the judge came down. The woman in charge of health in Douglas County was given the authority by the city of Omaha to serve as their medical specialist. She pursuant to specific language in the city charter and she's representing the city of Omaha, is supposed to, shall impose whatever uh, restrictions are necessary to deal with infectious diseases and so forth. Well, it was a woman who made that decision. And in all enclosed public places and some businesses, unless there is room for social distancing, a mask must be worn and the governor, who is a man, the attorney general, who is a man, both Republicans, both chauvinists, both narrow minded, both ignorant, both followers of Trump and Trumpism didn't like what this woman did. So they said, well, she's an unelected official doing this. Why and how is she doing it? She should have gone to the director of the State Department of Health and Human Services and gotten permission. Well, the director of health and human services at the state level is not an elected official. This is somebody who is appointed by the governor. So they are not even consistent. They're not logical. They're white male chauvinists. And a lot of white women have been indoctrinated to go along with whatever they do in the Republican, like Amy Melton, who is a Republican on the city council. So the attorney general, in complicity with the governor, filed an action in court to have this mandate that she put in place pursuant to the specific authority in the city charter, have the judge overturn it. Let me read the outcome. And I'm just gonna read this article without commenting along the way. Headline in Wednesday's paper, city mask mandate remains in place. Oh, and by the way, today is Wednesday. Subhead, there's no easy way for state to appeal ruling. 
The ink had just dried on a judge's order upholding the city of Omaha's mask mandate Tuesday when an attorney opposed to the mandate set eyes on whether they could get the issue before another set of robes, meaning judges. Dave Lopez, a private practice attorney and former assistant Nebraska attorney general representing three Republican members of Omaha City Council, said he was exploring how and how quickly this case could get to Nebraska Supreme Court, which shows he doesn't know anything about the law. The short answer, it probably will not be quick or easy. In the vast majority of cases, the Nebraska Supreme Court requires that any appeals be based on a final order. Douglas County District Judge Shelley Stratman merely declined to issue a temporary restraining order on Tuesday and isn't close to a full hearing on the case. Judge Stratman pointed to Nebraska Supreme Court decisions that say a judge's ruling on, quote, a temporary injunction is not an appealable order, unquote. And that's because it's not a final judgment. Additionally, in her 30-page decision, Stratman emphasized that both sides will present evidence at a yet-to-be-scheduled permanent injunction hearing. At such a hearing, the state could present additional information that would change her mind regarding who has the power, quote, to enact measures related to communicable diseases in the city of Omaha, unquote. The state had argued that such mandates require approval from the Nebraska Department of Health and Human Services. Well, like I said, the person who runs Health and Human Services is not an elected official. For now, Stratman rejected that argument. Siding with the city and county, she pointed out that the plain language of the Omaha Municipal Code required that, quote, the health director shall take all measures necessary to prevent the introduction of malignant, contagious, and infectious diseases, unquote. The Omaha City Council gave Douglas County Health Director Lindsay Hughes the authority to act as the city's health director. In turn, the judge decided she had a right to impose a mask mandate to try to quell the ongoing surge in COVID-19 cases. Quote, this plain text appears at least at this stage to support the authority of the city and county uh, assert Dr. Hughes's, the, to assert she possesses that authority, the judge wrote. Lopez, who represents council members Amy Melton, Brinker Harding, and Don Rowe, said that, quote, although res we respectfully disagree with this court's conclusion, we appreciate the attention the court devoted to this case on such a short timetable, unquote. Quote, this is, as the court recognized, a critically important case about the balance of governmental power, unquote, Lopez said. Quote, as such, we believe it should ultimately be decided by the state's highest court and as quickly as possible, unquote. It, it's not going to go anywhere because the Supreme Court doesn't have to accept a case. And they can also buck it down to the Court of Appeals. This is not an earth-shaking case. It's what the Republicans and Donald Trump and those Ill ignorant people, the conspiracy theorists, it's what they want, it's important to them, but it's not to the courts. Nebraska Attorney General Doug Pe Peterson said his office disagrees with the decision, but recognizes the quote, high bar, unquote, required to put a stop to a law. Quote, a very important question still needs to be resolved in this case, unquote, Peterson said in a statement. Quote, that question is whether our laws allow one unaccountable official to unilaterally impose these kinds of mandates on individuals and businesses backed by the threat of fines and punishment and or punishment. First of all, He's misstating it. She's not an unaccountable official. She is accountable to the city and to the county, and she was granted authority 
by the city charter. No date has been set for a permanent injunction hearing. In a two hour hearing Monday, attorneys had pointed out that Hughes, desperate to combat COVID-19, had sought the Council of City and County Attorneys to see if she had a path to a mask mandate. Hughes then gave a report to the County Board on Tuesday morning, suggesting that COVID-19 cases appeared to be starting to coming be starting to come down off of hopefully the peak of this Omicron spike. By noon Tuesday, she got word that the judge had upheld the mandates. Then it goes on to discuss some of the things that the state was saying, that the main is matter. She has that authority and she carried it out. Here's what I really wanted to get to. It was in December's World Herald, December 19, six days before Christmas, another trauma linked to COVID, more amputations. Philadelphia, when Candace Davis contracted COVID-19 in August, she quarantined herself in her South Philadelphia apartment and settled in for what she thought would be a short recovery. But within days, Davis, 30, was in the ER, shocked by the directive she'd just gotten from a doctor, go on a ventilator or risk death. Three weeks later, she woke up to her mother, Paige, standing over her. Baby, I know this is going to be hard and sad, she said, but you have to make a decision, unquote. In the weeks she lay unconscious, during which doctors had to transfer her from a ventilator to an ECMO machine, a device that pumps oxygen directly into the blood, and there'll be a description of it. Davis had developed life-threatening heart complications and then circulatory problems in her arms and legs. Now, her mother told her, she was again facing a life or death situation. For her to survive, doctors would have to amputate her arms. I said, if my arms got to go, they got to go, she said. It's my life. Davis is one of a small but growing population of COVID-19 patients who suffer one of the disease's most serious complications, and it hasn't been discussed. Circulatory crises caused by clotting that diminishes blood flow to the limbs, tissue dies and infection sets in. That's what the doctors explain. The affected limbs have to be removed for the patient to survive. The risks are highest for older people with pre-existing conditions like diabetes and peripheral arterial disease. And at the same time, doctors warn, they're having to perform more amputations on people with diabetes, some of whom didn't have COVID, but who may have avoided needed medical care during the pandemic. But as Davis illustrates, it can happen even to young, healthy people who do not have diabetes or other pre-existing conditions. Now, with COVID cases rising and the Omicron variant sparking new fears, Davis is telling her story to urge other young people to take the pandemic seriously. I'm 85 July 10th. I'm an old person imploring people to get your vaccinations, get the booster shots, wear the masks where appropriate, observe social distancing. I may be healthier than the average 85-year-older, 65-year-older, or even 30-year-older. Be all that as it may, that's no guarantee that Cyrus may not find an entryway into me and strike me, but I'm going to do everything I can to retain my health, to maintain my life, and be here as long as I can, even though, as the Bible says at this stage, my days are faster than a weaver's shuttle. And obviously, I'm much closer to the end of the road than to the beginning.
continuing. In the weeks after Davis woke up, she lost her arms below the elbows, a leg below the knee, and part of that remaining foot. Davis, who was not vaccinated when she contracted the virus, is urging others to get the vaccine. Quote, I know it's scary. I was scared too, she said. I didn't have time to get it. But get the vaccine. You don't want to lose your limbs. And most importantly, you don't want to lose your life, unquote. Why limbs are lost. Amputations have become more common during COVID-19, according to the Amputee Coalition, a support and advocacy group for people with limb loss, in part due to the virus's potential to cause increased blood clotting. The details of how COVID cases causes clotting are still being researched, said Julia Glazer, a Penn medical Pen, P E N N, not like penitentiary, a Penn medicine vascular surgeon who treated Davis. But the virus appears to damage the limbs of the blood vessels that ensures blood flow easily through the body. In some people, this can result in large clots that can cause strokes. In patients like Davis, tiny, virtually undetectable clots can form throughout the body. In a limb, they can hinder circulation enough that it dies and must be removed to save the patient's life. One study from July 2020 found that COVID infections increased the likelihood of a leg amputation by 25% and that the risk was greater for people who also experienced pulmonary or systemic complications from their infection. People with cardiac conditions and diabetes are particularly at risk. Because blood was not adequately circulating through Davis's limbs, Glazer said, the tissue started to die and infection set in. She needed life support medications to keep her blood pressure up at a sustainable level. That's when Davis and her doctors made the decision to amputate. Quote, I was sad but I'm more than my arms. I'm more than my limbs, Davis said. If they got to go for me to live, it was harder to accept the lower limb loss. Quote, with my legs, I was more emotional, emotional because I would like to be independent. I would like to be independent. I would like to not have anyone else bathe me or feed me but that's the way it is, she said during an interview last month at Penn Presbyterian Medical Center, where her sunny outlook astonishes her care team. Quote, and I'll be learning in rehab how to be more independent, she said. Mark Terragosa, 65, experienced a similar journey with his COVID infection, but is more than a year ahead of Davis in adjusting to the dramatic changes the virus has made in his life. Before contracting COVID in April 2020, long before vaccines were available, the Clementon, New Jersey native was athletic, a master in the Korean martial art, Tang Soo Do. He had none of the pre-existing conditions that even early in the pandemic doctors were connecting with the most serious complications. But he was so ill that he first was on a ventilator and then an ECMO machine and suffered two heart attacks while unconscious. Two months after his hospitalization, his extremities were swollen and black from lack of circulation. On June 23rd, 2020, he lost his left leg below the knee and part of his right foot. About a week later, doctors amputated both his hands. Terragosa was not fully conscious before or immediately after his surgeries. His first clear memory after the amputation, he said, was waking up and trying to push himself up in bed. Quote, I tried to push my hands into the bed, but I could not, he recalled. I said, what happened? Where are my hands? Then he realized he had lost much of his left leg too. 
linked to diabetes. Both Davis, who worked as a flight attendant, and Terragosa, a former employee at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, had no pre-existing conditions before they contracted COVID. But for people with conditions like diabetes, the risks of circulatory complications and amputation are even greater. People with diabetes, a condition that affects circulation and requires careful medical monitoring entirely aside from COVID, have borne a heavy burden during the pandemic. A November 2020 study of diabetes patients with foot problems found they were 10.8% times more likely to have any to have any amputation during the pandemic than before it and almost 13 times more likely to need a major amputation amputation defined as removal of a leg below the knee or higher too many amputations over the last two years were not a result of COVID-19, though, and could have been avoided, said Aja Kumar de Rao, a Temple Health physician with expertise in internal medicine, endocrinology, and diabetes. Amputations were already increasing before COVID-19 came, he said, and the pandemic's lockdowns and restrictions, along with people's fears of exposure to the virus, led people with diabetes to skip routine care, which in turn made them more susceptible to an amputation. Quote, people early in the pandemic were afraid to come into the hospital, even though they knew there was something wrong with their feet or their limbs, Raul said. There's a delay in detection a day at a time. As Davis recovers from amputation, she said she is excited to get healthier, to walk on prosthetics, and to live as independently as possible. Her brother Ali visits her every day. He contracted COVID around the same time she did, but he had been vaccinated and had a far milder case. Quote, that's why people need to be vaccinated, she said. My brother lost his taste and smell for a while. I lost my limbs, Candace Davis said. Davis's mother Paige works in housekeeping at UC Health Memorial Hospital Central in Colorado Springs. That's where Candace and Ali grew up. Paige Davis has worked alongside doctors and nurses for 15 years and saw the pandemic's devastation up close but she was stunned by how quickly her daughter neared death. Quote, it was hurtful, it was scary. I work at a hospital and to have my children go through this, I didn't know how to react to it at all, Paige Davis said. It was overwhelming. All we did was start praying. I have my moments when I'm by myself, when I fall apart. You stand back up and shake it off and keep on moving. The strongest one out of all of us is Candace. She has her crying days, she has her good days, but she's stronger than all of us." Unquote. Paige Davis flew to Philadelphia as Candace was placed on the ECMO machine in August and comes back for visits as often as she can. The family spent Thanksgiving weekend together at Penn Presbyterian. Candace Davis, who has a sociology degree with Colorado State University, has long thought about nursing, experiencing how her nurses cared for her and forming friendships with them has only cemented her goal. Quote, I know I can't do some nursing, but talking to the nurses in here, some have explained to me there are other areas of nursing I can get involved in, she said. I'm very into anatomy, physiology, women's health, watching them, seeing what they do. It's like, I can do that, end quote. Her immediate goal is inpatient rehab at McGee Rehabilitation, where Terragosa spent more than two months last summer. Inpatient rehab can take a few weeks or up to several months and typically continues with therapy at home and outpatient rehabilitation for months after that, said Paula 
Bonsell, an occupational therapist and therapy supervisor at McGee's Stroke and COVID programs. With amputees also recovering from a severe case of COVID-19, the first step is simply restoring basic strength. That's what Johnny Rogers is trying to do now, get his strength back. He had COVID and pneumonia, lost 35 or 40 pounds. Every day is a struggle, but he said he's going to whip it. And with his determination, the health that he had before, and he was not vaccinated, there's a good chance he will overcome. And I, I've talked to him. I told him, when you do, you need to get out and talk to people. And he'll do that. Quote, even the ability just to sit up is impaired because their chest muscles are weak. Their resp respiratory system is weak. They've been in bed for how long, right? Said Bonsell. We kind of start with the basics. Terragosa could barely raise his arms away from his body at first, he said. As he gained strength, he learned to get from the bed to a chair, to stand with assistance, and then to use his new prosthetics. He started by walking in a harness that supported his weight. Quote, 30 steps, he remembered. Back and forth, back and forth, unquote. Terragosa received body-powered prosthetic hands, which he can open and close by contracting or relaxing muscles like those in the shoulder or tricep, Bonsell said. They have to sort of learn cognitively as well as physically how to trigger those muscles in order to use it appropriately, she said. By the time he left McGee, in October 2020, Terragosa could walk laps on his prosthetic, his prosthetic legs without additional support. He can eat on his own, he said, and has started golfing and even resuming some martial arts. Terragosa credits his Catholic faith with sustaining him and frequently reflects on Jesus' suffering. Quote, don't focus on something you don't have that you want. Terragosa said, as long as you have air in the lungs, you're alive. That's just what matters. And Johnny said, when he was recovering, he was taking oxygen, a sip at the time. Continuing, Davis too has relied on her faith and parishioners from her North Philadelphia church who visit almost daily. So do friends from Pinky Promise, a national Christian women's group that Davis joined before the pandemic. If I were with them, I would say take it a day at a time, Terragosa said of others who have suffered amputations as a result of COVID-19. That's how I do it even now. I'm just alive for today because today is plenty already. I don't know how much time I have left but I'm going to continue. See, I usually get signals from somebody in that other room, but right now I'm here alone, not afraid, but I don't wanna go overboard or too far over time. Here's something about the misinformation at public forums. Oh, this machine, this ECMO, a large tube is planted, I think, in the neck, and the blood drains out, or in the chest, and all the blood is drained out, and it goes into this container that pumps oxygen into it, and then through a lot of little tubes, it's replaced, or it re-enters the body. But because the lungs are so devastated, they cannot take in the oxygen, they cannot have the transference of oxygen that comes into the lungs, into the blood. So this machine does that work and it helps the heart too. The blood is drained out. Oxygen is pumped directly into that blood. And once it is oxygenated, then it's reintroduced into the body. And that's what that process, that ECMO machine 
will take a person through. When you look at the marvels of technology, science, and particularly medicine, it's almost mind boggling, but there's no limit to what the human mind can master. When you have people able to create these machines, doctors, surgeons, nurses, assistants, but mainly the experts, those who carry out tests, experiments, the chemists are dealing with sub-microscopic material. And some things are theoretical. They cannot see what they're dealing with. They speculate and theorize about what must be going on from what they see, and then certain results that are produced from and through their experiments. But when you have these kind of people working in this fashion, highly trained, very intelligent, and almost driven, they are the ones who ought to be listened to and heeded when occurrences in their field of study and expertise are involved. Don't listen to these idiots on Fox radio or the Trumpites or other silly people carrying signs saying, I have a right to do this or that, or the fools outright who say that COVID is a hoax. Ignore them. If you needed a tonsillectomy, your tonsils taken out, and somebody says, well, first of all, tonsils don't even exist. And you don't need to have any operation in your throat. There are no tonsils there. They want to implant chips in you so that they can monitor your movements. This is what the government is doing. That's the craziness that some of these anti-vaxxers are telling people that they're little tiny computer chips in the vaccine. And when you get vaccinated, these little chips are put into your system and they monitor everywhere you go. Now, how crazy and silly and stupid is that? But I don't argue with them. This is where I follow Jesus' advice. Leave them alone. They be blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will fall into the ditch. And those who've seen me on this program in days of yore have heard me quote the verse that Jesus gave when he said, they would not hear Moses, they will not believe the one returns from the dead. So there are people who have had Cyrus the virus, who had to be put on a ventilator, then this ECMO machine, and they somehow survived. In a way, you could say they came back from the dead, but they will not be believed. People will tell them, well, what you are imagining, all of those things. What the medical experts say, I take at face value, because they will acknowledge the limitations on what it is they have to offer. The scientists, I listen to what they say. They have brought us to where we are today. For this automobiles, incandescent lights, this microphone, even that craziness that you all can do on Twitter and Facebook and other social media, that's from the scientists. Is all that imaginary? Well, I know that imagination is funny why it can make a cloudy day sunny. It'll even make a bee think of honey. But there are realities. And the reality is this. Look at COVID as a sin. Not that you're smitten with COVID because you're sinning. But it's one of those where you can say the sin carries its own punishment. If you commit this sin of accepting COVID, the punishment goes right along with it. The ER, the ventilator, 
the ECMO, and then the Undertaker. I had an article that talked about the number of morticians who are dying. And it's strange to see that those who deal with the dead are themselves dying. But the headline, COVID-19 claims number of black morticians. And this was from September of last year. Losses leave holes in their communities. When the last mourners departed and funeral director Sean Troy was left among the headstones, he wept alone. For five decades, the closing words at funerals in this town of Mullins, South Carolina of 4,400 had been delivered by his father, William Penn Troy Sr. Now the elder Troy was gone. One of many black morticians claimed by a pandemic that has taken an outsized toll on African-Americans. How dumb can we be? I can say that. I'm black. Were I blacker, I could be prouder. And I'm saying that it's taking a heavier toll on people like me. I need as many of us alive and functioning as possible. I'm not in the legislature anymore. Maybe I'll survive long enough to go back again. Maybe not. Maybe I'll wind up someplace else where I will have the tools to do more than I can do now. But I need as many people as can survive. And when we let Cyrus the virus take us out of here and we listen to this craziness from these crazy white people, then we, some people would say, deserve what we get. I don't say anybody deserves to die of COVID. I'm not that kind of person. I might be very angry with you because you've done something to me and you're continuing to do it. But if you fell seriously ill, then all of that changes. You're no longer in a, in a position to harm me. If there's anything I could do that would ease pain if you had it, maybe I'm a fool, but that's what I would do. There are black people who stabbed me in the back and Cindy Granberry, who worked with me for 44 of the 46 years I was in the legislature, would say, Ernie, these people stabbed you in the back. Now they come to you for help. Why do you help them? I say, well, when I help them this time, I'll stand with my back to the wall. My philosophy, the, when I gave my word, my affirmation, when I put up my hand and said that I'm going to do this job to the best of my ability, I was giving my word. My word bound me was more binding on me than that oath where these people swear bind or bound them. Anybody who had a set of circumstances that brought them within the arena of what it is I should do as a senator, that's what I would do. There was a white farmer known as a white supremacist, hated black people. His name was Arthur Kirk. Some state troopers came on his land with a banker who was trying to serve papers to foreclose on a loan. First of all, that's a civil action. The police should not even be involved. To make a long story short, the state patrol troopers shot him dead. They said he fired his weapon. I investigate things. The weapon that he had had a jammed shell in the chamber. He couldn't have even fired it. I think they murdered him. When I came to that conclusion, I began my investigation. The outcome was that they would not confront people and have these standoffs as they did with him. And then I began to help his family. And people came to me and said, Ernie, why would you do that? He was a racist. I said, you all didn't kill him because he was a racist. If you killed him because he was a racist, you'd kill each other and then turn the gun on yourself. You killed this man. And under the circumstances that you did it, you deprived him of his rights and his family of a breadwinner. So there's nothing that I can do other than try to help his family. The, a few months later was the beginning of the next session of the legislature, they gave me a bouquet of flowers that I kept on my desk for years until they crumbled. But anyway, I think that my time is probably up and I wanna get the signal. Is my time up? Okay, I have a few minutes. 
I'm going to read this quickly. The deaths of black morticians are particularly notable because of the prominent role they have long played in many communities. Often admired for their success in business, a number, including the elder Troy, have been elected to political office, served as local power brokers, and helped fund civil rights activities. At the same time, the homegoing services they arrange have frequently served as communal touchstones, drawing mourners together with pageantry, preaching, and song. Black funerals are more celebration, and that's no disrespect to my colleagues across the country. We're more, I should say, intimate, said Harry P. Close, president of the National Funeral Directors and Morticians. Now, there is a national organization of funeral directors, but there has to be a parallel black one because these white organizations don't serve black people who are in the same line of work. But anyway, at least 95,000 black Americans have died of COVID according to an Associated Press analysis of data from the National Center for Health Statistics perishing at the highest rate of any racial group in the US. You all are playing into the white man's hands. Elijah Muhammad used to call him the blue eyed devil. You're playing into the devil's hands. There are some people struggling hard to try to get us some modicum of freedom to obtain the full enjoyment and benefit of the rights of citizens which any white thing getting off the boat and coming here becomes a citizen and has all the rights. We don't have them after we and our forebears have been here for generations, literally centuries. So we're struggling to get what white people get as soon as they get off the boat. And we need all of the people of our kind possible. We need education, knowledge is power. We need to master this system I practice what I preach. I went to a white people's system of government, which I hadn't even studied, the legislature. First thing I did was learn their rules, mastered them more than these white people, and beat them at their own game. So what did they do? They changed the rules, and I beat them under those rules. I said, the reason I always beat you is because I think, and you cannot, and if you doubt it, write to me. I'll give you my address. It's in the phone book. 1825 Benny Street. My phone number is 402-453-5378. The only bowing I did to high tech was to put an answering machine on my phone. And I was told that's not even low tech, Ernie. That's no tech. But nevertheless, if you want this kind of information that I'm talking about, how I beat them with their rules, they change them year after year, time after time, I'll send it to you. It's a poor car that won't toot its own horn. And then I'm wrapping it up. Not only did I make them change their rules in the legislature, they changed their constitution to get this one black man out of the legislature. At that time, outnumbered 48 to one. And because those 48 white people supposedly superior to that one black man. They couldn't write rules to stop him. The other white people said, well, the only way we can stop him is to kick him out of the legislature. And the only way to do that is to make it impossible for him to run. But the constitution will not allow that even to get rid of me. So they had to get rid of all 48 of the others to get rid of me. And then I was the first after I sat out four years to come back. And I told him, in Revelation, there's a verse. God says, I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. I said, you all have made me the God of this legislature. I'm Alpha because I'm the first one to come back after being term limited out. There can only be one first, and that is me. I'm your Alpha. Because of term limits, Nobody can stay in the legislature as long as I did. So I'm also Omega, the last. I'm the last of those who can be this long in the legislature. So as far as the white people's legislature is concerned, I am their God. I am their Alpha and their Omega, and they can't change that 
no matter how long this state stands. And now it's time for me to say what the canary says when they told him that the cage door was open. I'm out of here. Thank you for watching the Ernie Chambers show. If you'd like to make suggestions, email us at ewcfacts at gmail.com. That's ewcfacts at gmail.com. This has been an EWC Communication Production.